taking views from, uh, from organizations and from people who influence the debate about debt, deficits, uh, budgets, and um, this is the third in a series uh, where the public agenda has come to the Academy and with the Academy hosted an event around what their survey data is showing. I am, as you no doubt can tell, by virtue of kicking this off, the president of the National Academy of Public Administration. And um, so that I not take up a huge amount of your time, but that I certainly endorse <coughs> my organization, there is on each of your chairs a little brochure that describes the National Academy of Public Administration. We are an independent, not-for-profit organization founded to deal with complex management issues and challenges. Uh, we've been around for just under 50 years. We're congressionally chartered. Uh, probably the most interesting thing in that brochure is on the inside front sheet where it uh, summarizes our fellows. We've got nearly 700 fellows, but they come from a very wide spectrum. And they are experienced public administrators, leaders, executives, academics, not only do they understand the federal environment, federal agencies, and issues surrounding federal agencies, but we have a large group of state and local practitioners, and we have a large group of academics, and we have a number of people who cross between private sector and public sector, sometimes numerous times. So we've got an incredibly rich fellowship um, that I really think uh, gives us an ability to uh, marshal forces to look at, at issues. And um, what I'm really trying to say, uh, we're much better than the consulting firms around the world. <laughs> 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 anyway, without uh, much further ado, Scott Biddle is the, the man who manages uh, public agendas, public opinion, research, and analysis. Um, he is by training and experience an uh, editor and reporter. He's an editor and a reporter in both traditional journalism, the stuff that I grew up reading, and all the online, uh, and in the online uh, journalism field. Um, he's also an author who has tried valiantly to help the citizenry of this country understand federal budget, federal debt, bring um, his research and his writing uh, an understanding of, of um, what's going on in this town in terms of using tax revenues and appropriations and spending and setting the stage for I think what's going to be a very, very tough couple of years here to come to grips with issues that have not uh, dealt with uh, either certainly not in a timely fashion, and certainly not in, in a way that is really dealt with the underlying, uh, fundamental underlying challenges. So um, I could read about uh, Mr. Biddle's awards for his journalism, but I think the best thing would be to say that he's a knowledge journalist who has uh, awards for both his, his work in the uh, traditional uh, print media and in online journalism as well. So with that, Scott, over to Thank you very much, and thank you to Napa for hosting us today. You know, public Agenda, as, um, as you may know, is an organization, a nonprofit part of a nonprofit organization founded by Ken Nikolovich, one of the great names of public opinion research, and Cyrus Vance, the former Secretary of State. And our mission is to work on tough public problems, particularly ones that are gridlocked because of gap between perceptions of leaders and the public on a given issue. We do that with public opinion research, and we do that with public engagement and citizen education. And of all the issues we work on, the national 
national debt, the federal deficit, is a classic example of a place where that gap between leaders and the public exists. On one hand, it is the wonkiest of policy issues. And on the other, it is an issue that the public will not allow the wonks to fix by themselves because it affects their taxes, it affects their benefits, it affects what government is all about. So if we don't cross over that gap, if we don't bridge that gap between the two groups, we don't actually get anywhere. This piece of research, which is part of the Our Fiscal Future Initiative, funded by the MacArthur Foundation, and something Public Agenda is working on <coughs> with NAPA, is designed to track and measure attitudes inside the beltway about this issue. And there are a couple of critical questions we're trying to answer. How do people inside the beltway, you know, the people who hold the levers of power, see this problem? Do they think it's fixable? Do they think we're making progress? What's the political atmosphere that they're operating in? And is it changing? We started doing this a year ago. We've done it. This is the third round. We've been doing it at six month intervals. We've been using what's called the Beltway Influencers Omnibus, which is a Harris Interactive Survey, which looks at two groups. One is what we're calling leaders, congressional and executive senior staff, heads of nonprofits, interest groups, media executives, you know, the people who are actually making decisions. The other is what are called elites, and they are politically active citizens of the Washington metro area. They are the city in which the leaders swim, the people they meet, the people they listen to, and the people who follow issues inside the Dunway closely. One of the big changes here that we've seen over the past year is priority. A year ago, and even only six months ago, the economy was a clear top priority for leaders inside the government. That has changed. Now, the deficit and national debt are essentially on a par with the economy in terms of what leaders say is the most important problem facing and as you probably know, this is a bit of a disconnect with the public. If you look at the general public polls, concern about the deficit has risen, without a question. And it's often number two in polls. But the economy is still a clear leader. So for people who are concerned about the deficit and national debt, this is a positive sign. The opinion elites, the citizens in Washington, normally look a lot like the general public compare their results in this survey to what you see in surveys of the general public. On this issue, they're tracking more with leaders. It's also on a par, our fiscal problems, with the economy. So this is a pretty significant shift in the last few months. There are some other signs that also show that this issue is becoming a higher priority. The number of leaders who say that elected officials factor in the national debt when they make decisions has doubled over the year we've been doing this survey. The ones who say they've been seeing more <coughs> policy proposals to solve this problem has also doubled. And everyone here is very much into this issue. I'm sure we can all reel off the long list of commissions and, and think tanks and so on and put out reports. And it is having an impact. Substantial numbers also say the President's fiscal, fiscal Commission had a positive impact on the debate. But significantly, 4 in 10 aren't sure yet. And yet, one thing hasn't changed. Only about half of both leaders and these politically active citizens say that the cost of a project, the impact on the budget, is very important to their own decision-making, what they support, what they choose to do. 
And that hasn't changed since last year. Another key question is, can this actually be fixed? And one of the consistent findings over the year we've been doing this has been about 8 in 10 say, yes, there are practical approaches that will address the country's needs and still not cause the debt to significantly rise. So it is doable. And yet, at the same time, people aren't sure they'll actually do it. Nine in 10 are saying Congress is a period of partisan conflict, not cooperation. Not a big surprise. Um, eight in 10 of the opinion leaders think practical solutions will be impossible to achieve because of partisanship. Leaders have become a little more optimistic. And since they're the ones actually in the room, maybe that's very important. Two thirds still say practical solutions will be impossible because of partisanship, but the numbers dropped. To me, this is one of the most interesting findings in Brian What you're seeing here is a comparison on one of the classic questions of public opinion research. Is the country moving in the right direction, or are we off on the wrong track? Pollsters love this question. Asking it for decades. And the reason they love it is it's a gut check question. You don't need to follow the news closely. You don't need to be closely informed. It's an emotional gut sense if things are going well or not. Even the image is vivid. You know, a train going off the tracks. The general public is significant more to say the country is off on the wrong track than leaders are in Washington. 70% in the April New York Times CBS poll say the country is off, off on the wrong track. Only 44% of leaders in Washington think that. To me, one of the things that Every management textbook, every, you know, every memoir by a business leader or a coach or anyone like that, one of the big lessons is that a leader has to project confidence and optimism. So here we have a situation where leaders seem to have a sense of confidence and optimism, at least more than the public, but it's not getting across to the people they're supposed to be leading. This is a really interesting challenge in terms of reaching across that divide. So what about some of the practical questions? Well, the big one in everyone's mind is the debt ceiling. In Washington, it's, a, it's pretty clear. Two thirds of the leaders and the majority of the opinion elites say Congress should raise the debt ceiling. There's a partisan divide on that. I'll come to that in a minute. But overall, two-thirds is a pretty comfortable majority. Now to the question that I know gives everyone in Washington jitters, which are the general public polls on this, which are in a very different direction. This happens to be the Gallup question that they asked earlier this month. There are others. I know the Washington Post had something earlier this week. The public is much more skeptical about raising the debt ceiling. However, the big thing I would point out about these polls is look at the don't knows. In public opinion research, anytime you get double digit don't knows, 10% or above, you should consider the findings following, subject to change. Here we have one third don't knows. Uh, the post survey uh, that came out yesterday had an even bigger number. I think they had 48% who said they didn't feel they understood what would happen if Congress failed to raise the debt ceiling. These are signs of uncertainty. And they're signs that even yes or no answers may not hold 
because people may not have firm opinions on this. Could be a lot of reasons for this. If I would, I, and I know some other people here too, were at the Peterson Fiscal Summit yesterday. Somebody asked Bill Clinton about this, and he had, I think, a very good answer. People, people don't understand what it means to not raise the debt ceiling because they've never seen it before. It's never happened. So how can the public visualize what the implications might be? Another factor might also be maybe people can't tell the difference between this argument and a lot of the standard political maneuvering that goes on in Washington. You know, we've had a number of budget cliffhangers. Do people really understand whether or not this is different from the other ones? If you look further at what should be done, we have majorities of both leaders and elites saying that yes, it will take both cutting spending and raising taxes to make progress on this issue. On other things, they're much more divided. The divides on the Obama health care law within the Beltway are as big as the divides outside the Beltway. You know, they're very strong, divided opinions about whether or not it would be good or bad for the federal budget. And of course, and this is no surprise to anyone, the partisan split on these issues can be huge. Uh, somehow, even though it's no surprise, when you look at that column on the right, the partisan difference, just seeing it expressed numerically, kind of really brings it home. Um, you know, now, really fundamental issues. Is the debt a problem? You know, will reduce, you know, controlling the national debt help bring the economy up that much better? Should we raise the debt ceiling? These are fundamental kind of issues where there are significant divides within the leadership groups, even though majorities may be on the other side. So where does this lead us? Well, one thing, as I touched on before, is leaders are actually a little more optimistic about this than the general public is. So how do they convey that? Because they can't really move. They can't really solve this without public buy-in. So how do they convey that this can be done, that it should be done, and that they're capable of doing it? The other big lesson here is over the past year, all the efforts by many groups to raise the priority of our fiscal problems have gained traction. There has been movement. But what's needed now to move people to actual solutions? That's really the challenge we're facing. So I think we've got a great panel to start discussing that. Uh, I'd like to start off by introducing Steve Redford who will uh, be running the panel. Steve is a Napa fellow, but among other things, he's also the project director for the Peterson Pew Commission on Budget Reform. Housed at the New America Foundation, which came up with some, a fantastic report on what could be done and what targets we should aim at. Uh, he has extensive experience on this issue and was also a key player in the Choosing the Nation's Fiscal Future Report, which came out of Napa. So I'd like to turn things over to Steve and our panel. I suppose the series of questions or challenges or there are many aspects of this problem that we face as fiscal challenge, but we're going to focus this morning on the political aspect or dimension and specifically on the interplay between public opinion and leadership in trying to uh, come to grips with this. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, uh, we're going to spend the next hour talking about this, so I'd like to first introduce my illustrious colleagues here to my right, and then ask, pose a few questions to each of them uh, to answer in turn, and then open it up to have a more general conversation with the rest of, us, the rest of you, and you can pose your questions to Joe and to Rudy and to Scott. <clears throat> I've had the pleasure over the last three years of uh, working on this issue more or less continuously, and two of those years were spent, uh, Scott indicated, uh, on a joint, uh, working with a joint 
joint study uh, committee of the of this academy and the National Academy of Sciences that produced the report, uh, excuse me, the nation's physical feature, came out a little over a year ago now. Um, Rudy was the uh, co-chair of that panel with John Palmer, who's another fellow of this academy. Um, and Rudy, as you know, is a senior institute fellow at the Urban Institute. He was also the second, uh, as all of you know, the second director of the Congressional Budget Office for the first panel. And together with Alice Ridlin, the first director, uh, it's revealed uh, in a new book by another Academy fellow, uh, Phil Joyce, uh, who wrote a book about CBO, uh, really was critical, critical actor in the early days of that institution in creating a culture, a strong culture of uh, nonpartisan, rigorous, uh, and ambitious analysis that prevails today and you know how crucial it is to have leaders at the outset set the stage, set the culture and the tone for an institution. He was critical in building that institution. And as more recently I've had a chance of working with him as a, he's a member of the Peterson View Commission on Budget Reform, uh, so we can continue to see each other. Joe was also on the earlier study committee um, <coughs> for uh, looking at choices for the fiscal future. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, I remember um, also working with him for eight years at OMD when he was the chief economist there. And I also I recall that specifically that every Friday when the first staff would attend the senior staff meetings, Joe would have another piece of good economic news to report. And eight straight years of, of good news, it was relentless, ending with four years of budget surpluses. Maybe you could I couldn't make it up. <laughs> uh, no, I believe it was true. It seems we got to believe it. And uh, <clears throat> perhaps you could reprise that this morning with some good news. Uh, and Joe has also served uh, on the senior staff with John Spratt, the uh, chair of the uh, House Budget Committee, and is now uh, senior vice president of the Committee for Economic Development. So you know two people in this town more qualified to talk about these issues. Um, <clears throat> just take a minute to set the stage here. When we began the work in 2008, um, looking at, uh, which was funded, by the way, by the Parker Foundation, a very forward-looking um, plan to ask this group, the study committee, to look at these issues, um, the world was very different. The situation was very different. There had been many, many um, analyses by OMB, CBO, and others showing that the, that the federal government's budget was on an unsustainable course. Uh, we knew that in the abstract, but it wasn't a salient issue the way it is three years later. Uh, a lot has changed in that respect. It's starting to do. And I remember um, also it seemed more distant. Uh, after the financial crisis hit and uh, we were entering the Great Recession, I remember Joe one of, during the deliberation saying, um, we didn't know how close we were to hitting the wall, to actually experiencing a fiscal crisis. We knew it was out there somewhere in our future because this was an unsustainable path that the nation was on. But we knew now, uh, with the onset of the Great Recession, that we were five years closer. Of course, two more years have passed, and we're now two more years closer, so we're at least seven years closer. Actually, if you, actually, if you look at the uh, deterioration, of the budget situation is 15 years. We were going to hit, under the December 2007 uh, CEO long-term outlook, we were going to hit a debt to GDP ratio of 60% in 2022. And we did at the end of 2010. And I suppose the length of uh, Congress's actions extending for two more years the 2001-2003 uh, tax cuts didn't help. We still don't know quite where the wall is, but we're, we're definitely quite a bit closer, or put it in terms of this uh, metaphor of this conference, so the, the needle on the death clock has moved a lot closer to midnight. So that has changed. But also, uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the points of this uh, MacArthur-funded uh, study by the two academies was to demonstrate not only the size of the problem people were beginning to recognize, but that there were many, many options for dealing with. 
that there were different plans, and depending on your political preference, you might like one or more or another, but there was a range of options, and we illustrated those with four different plans that ended up stabilizing the debt at different levels with different levels of taxes and spending. And that study, and since then, as Scott mentioned, there's, there have been many, many more plans. Uh, and the President's Fiscal Commission came out with this plan. Uh, I didn't mention it, but Joe, you were on, on a panel chaired by Alice Goodwin and uh, Peter Minichi, Senator Minichi, that came up with a plan, uh, which was presented yesterday along with five other plans at the Peterson in, uh, Foundation's Fiscal Summit. So there, there's no shortage of plans. Uh, <coughs> I'll not overlook a few, but there, we have many ways to avoid hitting the reef from use of not uh, but we uh, don't have necessarily have the political solution, which is instrumental. So we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> so that, that helps, I think, set, set the stage for my first general question to these, these two. And that is, <clears throat> Scott has demonstrated to us that there's been an evolution, especially in the last year, in thinking inside the Beltway about this problem. Uh, not only greater awareness, or perhaps concern or alarm about the problem, but some optimism among leaders uh, about the possibility of remedial action. Um, but as you also suggest, there seems to be a perhaps an even greater disconnect between leaders and the public in general about what to do about this problem. There's readiness, perhaps, on the part of the public to recognize that it's a serious problem and make it a priority, but not necessarily there seems to be, a, in fact, polarization. Uh, solutions. Um, <clears throat> in that setting, is there really, uh, I must ask Rudy first and then Joe to comment on this, is there really reason for optimism about uh, the ability to reach an agreement and to enact a deal? And, find, and, and <clears throat> if there is a big deal that's reached in the, say, the negotiations that are now being led by the Vice President, um, in some closed door setting, endorsed by the leaders of the two parties, is that going to be acceptable to the public without more preparation and education? So that's, that's the question. That's the political question I want to start with. Well, I thought the scariest part of Scott's poll was the extraordinary, the big gap between the two parties on their attitudes to various various issues. With, uh, I think it was 48% of Democrats who uh, didn't think, or only 48% who thought that that was the, was the problem with 90% of the Republicans thinking so, and uh, only, I think it was 28% of Republicans thinking that you needed action on both the revenue and spending side to uh, solve this problem. I used to refer to this gap as poison partisanship, but the more I've reflected on it, I'm not sure that partisan is the right word here. Um, hard to think of a more partisan person than Tip O'Neill, for example, or Ronald Reagan, for that matter, and yet they compromised on a large number of issues, and they um, even had a secret agreement not to oppose any of the Greenspan Commission proposals with regard to Social Security in 1983. I mean, can you imagine President Obama and, and Speaker Boehner having that kind of agreement, it just is not in the uh, cards. Uh, it would have been nice if they had such an agreement on the Fiscal Commission, for example. The <clears throat> so, but I think what's really going on here is, is not partisanship, but incredible ideological purity in, in both of the parties. Um, for reasons I won't bore you with, I've been looking at the 1950s fiscal history some, and one of the most remarkable differences between then and now is the change in the nature of the parties. In the 1950s, uh, the, the Democrats spanned the ideological spectrum from, uh, say, Proxmire on one end to uh, Senators Russell and Stennis on the other, who were the old Southern conservatives were incredible fiscal conservatives, uh, along with the, her, their other beliefs. Similarly, on the Republican side, uh, the Goldwater people were just starting to show their muscle. The, the 
the span went from, <clears throat> let's say, Senator Javits to Senator Goldwater. And there was huge uh, ideological overlap between the party. We just don't see that today. And I think that's what really makes us a difficult problem, and that's what really depresses me. the one thing I would add to, your, to Rudy's very last observation, uh, pointing to Senator Goldwater, of course we found out, uh, perhaps better than we knew before, uh, in just the last year, I think, that Senator Goldwater and Senator George McGovern were great personal friends uh, and apparently spent a lot of time together, knew each other's relatives, uh, and yet, of course, we're at opposite poles of the, uh, the political spectrum. Uh, Jim Thurber at the American University in the political science department is my connection on a lot of these things. And uh, he's pointed out, again, per Rudy's last point, that when the two parties in the Congress are charted according to their voting patterns, that what used to be a substantial overlap between the two parties has totally disappeared. Uh, you used to take the two parties, put them together, you come to something like a normal distribution of ideological orientations, now you take them separately and they're totally bimodal, with virtually no overlap in uh, voting pattern. And then, of course, if you say you're going to have to come up with a solution to this problem that is somewhere in the center, uh, the question is, uh, is the center a null set? Um, and that's, that's a little scary. Um, I found a lot in Scott's poll that to me was, uh, you know, rang true, and of course you have to be careful when uh, you come to the conclusion that a poll reflects reality because, yeah, you want to be confident that you represent reality, and I'm not always sure anymore um, uh, in terms of the passage of time. I, I, I was thinking Steve's remarks about a, uh, a proximity to the debt limit, the birthday party, the birthday card I got more than two decades ago, which read, turning 40 is not the end of the world, but you can see it from <laughs> uh, I think I think where we've got uh, now is, is with respect to the debt situation, we're getting close to the point where we can see the end of the world, and that, that is indeed scary. And I remarked on that a little earlier. I don't want to take up too much time because this is going to be an interesting conversation. Um, why public opinion has shifted so much in the last year? Um, you know, we are piling up debt at this point at a really remarkable rate. If you think about running deficits in excess of 9% of GDP in an environment where there is, for all practical purposes, no inflation, and I'll differ with some critics of the Federal Reserve right now. For all practical purposes, no inflation and real economic growth that is somewhere between the cellar and the ground floor, uh, the increase in the ratio of the debt to GDP in a one-year span is, is really frightening. Uh, and so probably what we are observing is people observing that and getting very nervous, and I don't find that really terribly surprising. But as I thought about trying to relate that to where we are right now in public opinion and also where we are in terms of policy uh, in a political environment, the thought that crossed my mind was there, there is an analogy between where we are right now and where we were in the uh, early 1970s. And Rudy, I'd be interested in reactions to this. In the early 1970s, we had a phenomenon that was called stagflation. And at that time, people felt that there was uh, a policy dilemma. On the one hand, with slow economic growth, you wanted to stimulate the economy. On the other hand, you were concerned that if you stimulated the economy, you would increase inflation. 
Uh, so to some extent, we were in a dilemma. We, we had no good choice. Now, of course, we are in a situation where, on the one hand, we have slow economic growth, which would encourage us to stimulate the economy, where fiscal stimulus very clearly and very directly adds to what is already and unfortunately high and frighteningly rapidly growing public debt. <laughs> so in the same sense, we're in the horns of a policy dilemma, which might make our situation a lot more difficult to deal with. Um, and to some extent, I think that may be a source of difficulty among Washington elites and leaders who are schooled in these issues. And then, of course, we get to the difficulties we have in relating Washington opinion to national opinion. We're out in the hinterlands. Uh, there's the perception that running into a debt limit to the extent that the U.S. Treasury is pushed into default might not be the worst thing in the world. Uh, and. Uh, Confronting that opinion uh, from the perspective where default, uh, actual uh, erosion of all of the borrowing room that is on the hands uh, of the Secretary of the Treasury uh, is really a frightening prospect. There are some s squares out there that we have to circle, or circles we have to square, uh, and it's going to be very difficult. Let me ask you, each of you, to follow up on that, Joe, Professor Mike, um, to talk about the situation we're in right now with regard to the debt limit. As you suggest, that's the immediate uh, and frightening prospect of uh, maybe. We, uh, we're dancing with the debt limit now. We, we have actually uh, danced off the edge of the cliff at, as of a couple weeks ago in the sense that we surpassed or reached the $14.3 trillion statutory limit on the debt. Uh, if you remember the old uh, Roadrunner cartoons, in each one of those there's a scene where the uh, coyote chasing the Roadrunner runs off the edge of the cliff, momentarily suspended in midair. We're kind of in that mode right now. We're off the, off the cliff, but we're suspended. Don't look down. Uh, we can do some fancy footwork to stay in that position for maybe a few more weeks, and then something terrible is alleged uh, likely to happen. But there's, there are other views on this. The, there's another view that says, Oh, technical default wouldn't be such a bad thing if it meant uh, a few more days after that we reached a, a big deal to really put us on the right course and avoid hitting, hitting the limit in the future or stabilizing the debt uh, somehow in the near term, the medium term. If we could do that, that would be a small price to pay, and a bondholder might look at that situation and say, oh, you know, I don't mind a, a late payment if it means that in the long run this is going to be a, a safe of uh, bonds to invest in. Uh, so there are two views on that, at least. And uh, the question is, uh, is, is this the crisis we've been waiting for? A lot of people have said to me time to time to time that it would be good to have an artificial crisis. I think Alan Trump among others. It would be good to have a sort of artificial mini-crisis to shock people into awareness and in action before it really is either too late or almost too late to do something that's not completely uh, painful uh, to, to change course. So the question really is in two parts, and maybe you can start, Joe, and then we pick up on this one, and then what will happen in the next few weeks, and what should happen? 